Paul Auster is here. New York Trilogy, his trio of postmodern detective novels, first earned him serious critical attention in the 1980s. His work's style and use of metaphysical subjects quickly earned him a wide European following. It was his venture into the film world, however, that helped to broaden his popular appeal in this country in the 1990s. He collaborated on a number of films, including Smoke and Blue in the Face. He has recently completed his 10th novel, The Book of Illusions. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome back. Thank you, Charlie. One of New York's finest, as they say. <laughs> uh, some say that this, that this is a kind of summary of your body of work. Is it? Um, In it's, some way? It's, I think it probably encapsulates a lot of the obsessions that I've been haunted by over the years. And yet, I think this book goes into new terrain as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm getting older, and uh, <laughs> your, 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 your view of the world begins to change. Uh, uh, for me, right around 50, yeah. uh, I felt this uh, tremendous uh, alteration in the way the world looked to me, the way my body felt. Mm -hmm. You know, we start to break down a little bit. But um, you reach a certain age, and a lot of the people you've loved are dead. A lot of the best friends you've had are dead. A lot of the relatives you've loved are dead. And, and you, 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 you're walking around with ghosts in your head as much as living with the, the people who are alive. And I realized at a certain point that I was talking every day to the dead as much as I was to the living. And uh, I think in a way this book emerged out of that sensation of passing time. Okay, and I want to come back to that very right. point, but let me just, before I leave this idea, your view of the world changes at 50, you think? Um, because because the, the people you've experienced life with are gone in many gone. cases? They're gone. You miss them. You, you, you want to continue talking to them. You begin to see your own end. It's uh, You're closer it's, to it's the a, end than you are the beginning. Exactly. A lot more behind you than in front of you. Yeah. I mean, a 20-year-old knows he's going to die, but uh, it's not part of it. It's, it's, not, it's not anything but a kind of abstract yeah. idea. But when you get past 50, I think uh, um, you, you're, pretty, you're pretty aware that your days are numbered. And I read the obituaries faithfully every day. After the sports pages, it's the obituaries. Why do you do that? I just want to see who's, who's no longer with us. And uh, it's remarkable how, how many young people drop mm -hmm. dead. You know, I read them too, and, and I, but I think for different reasons. I read them just for the sense of biography. Yeah. There's also, I think, obituary. It's a, which actually, we've talked about this before, but it's a good subject to do again on the show. You know, it is, it is changing. I mean, there's a great sense now that people are trying to look at it in a different way, not just a recitation. Some of that, <sighs> some of that was reflected in what the New York Times did yeah. with a portrait of grief. That was a very good project. I, I was uh, very happy they did that. I, I think um, it brought home the whole tragedy to us in New York and made it very personal and yeah. uh, and uh, I think that was the only way not to make it an abstraction yeah. it made know? these people they it, yeah. it showed their life yeah in a very real way and, and what they meant to people who live with them. yeah Janie Scott she did a great job yeah, she did she, she did a great right. job um, yeah. so you change your attitude <laughs> about life so you, you have this idea in bumping around inside your brain, and you decide to create a character. And so what you've got to do is create a character that loses family. Yeah, I mean, it's not a conscious decision. Uh, novels, you know, they, they, they bubble up inside you. They come out of your unconscious. <clears throat> it's not as though a novelist will sit down and say to himself, I want to write a book about something. Right. The material is given to you by some magic or mystery. It's in your head without your being aware of how it got there. If it's compelling enough and haunting enough, you start to think about it. And then little by little, more begins to gather around it and pretty soon a story starts taking shape. I mean, in the case of this novel, I began with the um, image of this silent film star, a comedian right. from the right. 20s. Hector. Hector Mann. A man in a white suit with a little black mustache. Yeah. I had him. Yeah, but you've got to set this up. Yeah. I mean, before that, there'd been a plane crash. Yes, the narrator is um, uh, a professor in Vermont, right. uh, teaches comparative literature, right. and his wife and two sons are killed in a plane crash. And he spirals into grief and 
moroseness yes, and alcoholism. Exactly. For about six months, he's uh, he's uh, one of the, uh, the the Walking Dead, you yeah. might say. And one night, he's um, sitting on his sofa in his little house in Vermont, um, inebriated as usual, surfing channels, and he stumbles on a uh, documentary about silent comedians. Yeah. And for want of anything better to do, he keeps watching. And suddenly there's a clip uh, of a comedian he'd never heard of. He doesn't even know much about movies, but someone named Hector Mann. And um, he watches it. It's about two minutes long. And suddenly, for the first time in six months, he laughs. He, something rises up in him, and he laughs. And it turns out that Hector only made 12 little films. They had pres been presumed lost. They've been turning up in archives over the last few years, mysteriously. And he decides, because he just doesn't know what to do with himself, to travel around the world, visit all these archives, and see every one of Hector Mann's films. Yeah. This leads to him uh, holding up in a, in a room in New York for a year, writing a book about these films. And um, everyone has thought that Hector is dead. He disappeared mysteriously in 1929, never heard from again. The story is taking place in the late 80s. Uh, after the book is published, he gets a letter, a little note really, from New Mexico, from a woman claiming to be Hector Mann's wife and saying, Hector would like to meet you. He's read your book. And in a way, there the whole story begins. You said, and I think you've answered this, but you said you could not have written this book earlier. I don't think That's so. That's because you were not, earlier you were not of the age you are now and didn't have the things that you talked about earlier. You had to go through that personally. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, um, so therefore, one carries along one's mental baggage all through one's life. I mean, the things that one writes about, they don't go away, but they metamorphose as the years go on. They, they, they change, and yet you're still the same person. <clears throat> you don't write a lot of dialogue. No, no, that's true. Why is that? Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in... Um, <laughs> You're you, movies. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But that's another way of writing, another yeah. form. <laughs> I'm interested in narrative propulsion, I suppose. Um, uh, I think the greatest, <laughs> nice the greatest um, influence on my writing are fairy tales. Uh, which, if you, if you study them carefully, you have almost no information. You know, once upon a time, there lived an old woman and her daughter in a dark wood. Well, you don't know the woman's name, you don't know how old the girl is, <clears throat> but you, as a reader, fill in the details. Mm. The, the imagination is never still. And, um, and then you're on to the next sentence, you know. One day, you know, a bird came down, and suddenly, within two sentences, you're wrapped up in the story. And this, this is the, uh, I think, the essence of storytelling, and I tend to think of myself more as a storyteller than as a novelist, even. Um, I'm trying to tell well, Shouldn't stories. all novelists be storytellers? Well, um, I, I think so. I mean, that's what I, that's what I try to do, uh, but, um, you know, a lot well, of... What's the difference in a novelist and a storyteller? You said you think we just have more as a novelist and a storyteller. Well, I think there are a lot of novels written, some of them brilliant, uh, uh, absolutely extraordinary, that are... Um, uh, what you might call meditations about things, yeah. uh, where we're not moving from one event to another, yeah, there's no but we're swirling around uh, the same event, for example, yeah. for, for a long time. Um, it just, it's, it, it's, it's not even a conscious decision. It's just the way my mind works, the way my body works, and it's the way I have to do it. Does film still have a huge appeal to you? Oh, I love it. I, I, and and, and, and the, uh, the, the work I did in film, I, I worked on three different films. Yeah. Uh, each one took about two years of my life. Uh, I, every single aspect of filmmaking is enjoyable to me, from, from you know, designing sets to picking the music to working with actors to the editing, the camera. Everything is wonderful. But... Uh, I decided after I had directed Lulu on the Bridge, right. this was about five years ago, which was one of the big experiences of my life, that if I mean to be serious about film, I have to do it full time. Yeah. It's not a hobby. It takes up 
100% of your waking life. And if you're not going to do it right, well, yeah, don't the, do it. And I thought, well, I, I can't give up writing the books. I mean, the books are, I have other books in me that I want to write. And uh, as we said, time is growing shorter. Yeah, but did you think at, at that time, that that time, in the 80s, was it, it was the 80s, was it? Uh, no, I, film work was all in the 90s. 90s yeah, right. I was thinking that wasn't that yeah. long ago. No. Uh, that did you did you think you could have been good? I think if I had stuck with it, I think I might have been good. Uh, I think I had a certain feel for it, and I was learning more all the time. And uh, but it would have meant a real total yeah. career change. And it's I, also collaborative, and what you do is singularly solo. Yes, and um, I mean, I know um, uh, in, in the other room is Dick Enberg, the great <laughs> sports announcer, and, yes. uh, yes. and, I, and I have to say that yeah. as a kid, I was uh, very involved in sports, yeah. and I loved playing on teams. Yeah. You know, baseball, basketball, those are my yeah. two sports. Yeah. Then I became a writer, and I spent all my time alone in a room. Yeah. And then when Wayne Wang, uh, the director of Smoke, lured me out of that room to right. work on the films, it was such a joy being on a team again, oh, I know. I and, and, and I, I really, really loved, I think, filmmaking yeah. as much for that as anything else. Yeah, I've, yeah. Had, I've had people of an academic bent come to me and say, you know, I'm going crazy sitting in this carol at a yeah. library, yeah. writing. I just, can I come work for you? I'll yeah. do anything, you know, yeah. but I just yeah. want to be involved in a collaborative effort rather than sitting writing, you know, on my dissertation. Yeah. I may come back to it, but... It, I, it was good for me to get out yeah. of that room for a while. I, I, I really enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, uh, lots of jokes, too. People yeah. uh, on a film set are uh, full of humor and energy, yeah. and yeah. most of them are quite young. And uh, it's, it's great. It's really great. Can I cha change the subject a moment to 9-11? Uh, you wrote an op-ed saying what? Uh, well, it's coming out on the 9th. Um, yeah. the, yeah, I was asked to. I think they've asked a number of writers right. to, uh, to, to write things. Um, the title that I gave it, I hope they keep it, I don't know, we'll see on Monday, uh, was NYC equals USA. Mm -hmm. And the point I tried to make was that, um, you know, I was involved in this uh, national story project for NPR uh, over the course of a year or two, um, reading true stories on the air every month. I received over 4,000 stories from around the country, written by so-called ordinary people, not professional writers. Everything from plumbers to doctors to policemen to farmers, housewives, everybody. I noticed um, there was a trend that was quite remarkable, is that the only city anybody ever wanted to talk about in their stories was New York. And I'm not just talking about New Yorkers. I mean people from all over who maybe had only visited here once. <clears throat> and I, I think it's because alone among American cities, New York is an idea as well as a place. And what is that idea? It's about diversity, tolerance, you know, trying to get along with each other, welcoming everybody. And um, those are, I think, the very core ideas of America at large. And people just tend to forget that New York really is the heartland. We are the heartland. Yeah. We're not some peripheral uh, island off the coast of the mainland. We, we embody what, what America's all about. We, we really do. I mean, that's yeah. well said. And 9-11 and <clears throat> had what impact on you? It was uh, personally, I mean, so many people lost their lives. And to talk about my own little story, you know, one feels almost ashamed. But... I must say, I, I lived through those days as a, as a kind of personal devastation. I was uh, stunned at first and then depressed for, for, for several months, uh, unable really to do much of anything. Uh, I experienced it almost as a kind of family tragedy in which you, know, you lose people you, you care about. Um, I think it, it wasn't until about Christmas that I, I started feeling Sorry, like tough. myself again. But in between, it was fascinating. Um, the book came out, the anthology of the NPR project. Right. And I went around the country with Jackie Lydon. You might yeah, know her of NPR. Yeah. She was the host on the program that we did together. And we hosted readings around the country um, in many cities with the contributors to the book from those areas coming up and reading their own stories. And it was remarkable, wonderful. 
it was really democracy in action, you see. And uh, the audiences were rapt. I, I've never seen such attentive and yeah. uh, excited audiences. This is right after September yeah. 11th, yeah. you know, in October and November. Right. And um, so I got to talk to a lot of Americans that fall. And um, it was very interesting how everybody seemed to take that moment as a chance to stop and think, who are we? What do we believe in? You know, what are our ideals? What separates us from the people who attacked us? And I think the word that kept coming up, the one that I kept hearing was democracy. I mean, that's our creed, democracy. And freedom. We, we don't always practice it very well, right. but that's, that's the, the bedrock uh, faith. And um, it's a very interesting. And um, I thought, you know, as I started to feel a little better, mm. uh, that we missed an opportunity at that time to, to, to reassess ourselves a little more thoroughly than we have. Mm. It's never been a time, perhaps in our national life, I think, in terms of an event. We needed it during any times of crisis, where there was a need, I think, for people of faith and people of creative, of crea people who are creators. Mm -hmm. To step forward and be a part of a national dialogue, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it 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 demanded, you know, I mean, even today, what kind of memorial? Well, we ought to is, be hearing from our writers yeah. and our artists and our painters, as well as our planners and yes. architects and politicians, well, and and never forgetting those uh, who were victimized by this and who suffered because of the loss of someone. Well, I think a lot of artists actually have been involved in trying to think yeah. of think of ideas, and uh, fortunately, the city proposed those rather mediocre plans. Right, Nobody right. liked them, and now it's opened up again. And right. I think there are a lot of architects and artists who've been consulted, and they're oh, they uh, and, yeah. and they're, they're from they're, around they're, the world. They're, they're looking for new ideas. Let me yeah. close with this: okay. What is it about Europeans and you? Um, <laughs> damned if I know. But they, you are. You know, some say as popular over there as you are over here. Well, I, I, I just, uh, I, it's, it's impossible to understand why people read books yeah. and why they pick a particular writer. I know. Uh, I or just, a particular actor. I mean, or, you know, or we all know it is. about sort of Jerry Lewis and Mickey um, O'Rourke and people like that in Paris. I mean, I hope my stories are, are talking to people, you know, beyond the borders of America, that, you know, just talking to human beings about their own situation their own lives and and maybe um maybe it's it's touched people i i, I can't really explain it but well, when you travel there you know that you know you have an audience there oh yeah definitely definitely it's quite quite extraordinary at times yeah. the ideas about legacy don't have any appeal to you do they i can't think about it <laughs> i mean who knows uh uh you you look at the the story of literature <laughs> Think of poor Hel Herman Melville, just, <laughs> yes. just for example. <laughs> yes. When he died... He wrote a book about a fish. When, when he died, people thought he was already dead. Yeah. There was only one obituary published. Yeah. He was the forgotten man of American literature. Right. It took another 30 years before uh, somebody stumbled upon a copy of Moby Dick in a second-hand bookstore for his reputation to, right? to start coming back. It was in the 1920s. Who the hell knows what happens to uh, a writer's work? Uh, people um, can like have Van Gogh. That's right. Or exactly, people have great success in their lifetime, then they're forgotten. Others, so obscure, like Emily Dickinson, who published three poems in her life. Now she's our greatest poet of the 19th century. Yeah. So who knows? You can't think about these things. Paul Auster, uh, the Book of Illusions, is his novel. And it's always good to have him here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. Thank you, my friend. As always.